Let's stand together and worship the Lord this evening. Oh, there's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispered sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 the sweetest name I know. singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing as I go. Well, soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing as I go. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight before we continue singing. Dear Lord, we're so thankful we can come to this place today. Father, and gather in your name and we can worship you. Father, I thank you for uh, your mercy. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for your love and watch care over us, Lord God. I thank you for this group of people that, that we call Cornerstone Church. Father, I pray that you'll pour your blessings about on us tonight. Lord, give us ears to hear your word and give us hands to feet to carry it out. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Give the Lord praise. Oh, I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay He tells me every care on him to roll He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has
Christ taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. Oh, I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. My heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. Oh, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. be seated. Guys, welcome everyone. I said welcome everyone. Amen. Jen, you left this stuff up here. It goes here. Do a little house cleaning first. Where's Rebecca at? Oh man, tell her we're praying for her. I don't like her when she's not here. But uh if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6, church. Good to see everybody here tonight. What a wonderful morning. What a wonderful day. People give their life to Jesus. It's always a good day. We hope when you came in that you got an outline entitled The Prayer Warrior's Prayer. If you did not get an outline, would you raise your hand? Anybody need an outline? Right up here, brother. There you go. Thank you. Brother Lynn needs one. Anybody else? Ephesians chapter 6. At the end of the service, some of the men are going to be passing these out. Some of you already asked about them. We'll do that at the end of the service. I don't want to give it to you now because you'll be pet cooning with this and not listening to the message. So uh, we'll pass this out at the end of the service. Those of you who are not here this morning, you'll find out what that's about in a few moments. But um, let me just share with you, if Jesus tarries... Wednesday night, we're going to look at a message that will be a blessing to all of us because it deals with the, um, 
with the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of biblical prophecy. Everything's happening in the last days, in the future, is going to be all about Jerusalem. You know, uh, I shared with you before that Bible prophecy in the second coming deals with three J's, the Jews, Jesus, and Jerusalem. The name, the word Jerusalem, are you listening, is found 811 times in the Bible. You don't need to be taking notes tonight. We'll do this Wednesday. I'm just kind of turning the waters a little. Can anyone tell me how many names there are for Jerusalem in the Bible? What do you think? Well, don't guess. There's 70. 70 names for Jerusalem in the Bible. You didn't know that. God loves it. Satan hates it. Jesus wept over it. The Holy Spirit descended in it. Nations are drawn to it. And one of these days, Jesus will come back and rule and reign there. Satan hates Jerusalem. It's where uh, the Battle of Armageddon is going to be all about. The Antichrist destroying. He's always had a hatred for Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem was decreed to be the capital of Israel 3,000 years ago by King David. It's a very moving experience for those of you who've been with us, but I've been there 12 times and it's, it's moving every time I go there. We've had to postpone our trip to Israel this year because it's all about God's time and not ours. I don't care. But we're scheduling it again March of 2023. My grandson and Hannah and Hannah's mother and her sister is going. That's four people that wasn't going with us this year, but they're going to go with us to Israel. Um, but one of the most moving places is when you go to Jerusalem. It's like having one foot in the past and one foot in the future. It's all Bible prophecy, all centers around the city of Jerusalem. Wednesday night, we're going to look at Jerusalem. You're going, to, you're going to learn some things about Jerusalem you never learned before, never heard about. But why it is the center of biblical prophecy. Uh, you know, the bear's on a prowl again. Russia is called the bear. Read the book of Ezekiel. He's called the bear. Russia's on a prowl right now around Ukraine. But if you know Bible prophecy, Ezekiel says he's going to be on a prowl again after the rapture of the church when he comes down to attack Israel. And uh, that's going to be all she wrote for Russia because God's going to destroy the Russian army with an earthquake. But the bear is on the prowl again right now in Ukraine. But Russia hates Israel. It's called Gog and Magog in Bible prophecy. But he's on the prowl again. He's just getting ready for Jesus to come. And... and, uh, But Jerusalem, one reason, Jack, I love Jerusalem is because you cannot spell Jerusalem without the USA. USA is in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. And so Wednesday night, I know we've got storms coming and stuff like that. That's fine, but be sure to watch Wednesday night because you can understand all eyes or on Jerusalem in Bible prophecy. There's a spy in the sky and his eye is on Jerusalem. God loves it. Satan hates it. Jesus swept over it. The Holy Spirit descended in it. Nations are drawn to it. And one day, Jesus will come and rule and reign in it. So Wednesday night, Jerusalem. Next Sunday night, if Jesus tarries, we're going to look at the five greatest pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament. The five great, it's not Noah's Ark. The five greatest pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament that prove beyond a shadow of doubt 
he is the Christ of the New Testament. But there's five, the greatest, the five greatest pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. He's not just the Jesus of the New Testament. He's the Jesus of the Old Testament. And you're going to see the five greatest pictures of Jesus in all of the Old Testament next Sunday night. It'll be a blessing to you and what it means to us today. So I'm excited about sharing these truths from God's Word with you. And I'm especially excited sharing tonight this message uh, from Ephesians 6. If you've got it, say you got it. Let's stand and honor God's word together. Prayer warriors, prayer. Starting in verse 10, we're going to get down to 18, but get the background of this. Put in, finally, my brethren, put this, put, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It's all about that armor of God is because we have an enemy called the devil. He gives us the armor there in these verses, but then let's go down to verse 18, what we're going to look at tonight. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching there and too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Prayer warriors, prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Those that are home tonight, those here at Cornerstone, would you join with me, please, as we pray for my hearts. Dear Jesus, please speak to my heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know that prayer is the lifeline to our Heavenly Father. Look up here, guys. Prayer is to our spirit what blood is to our bodies. Without it, we're dead. Spiritually, we're dead without prayer, guys. What blood is to our physical bodies, prayer is to our spiritual life. Without it, it is our lifeline to our Heavenly Father. Prayer was so important in the life of Jesus when he came to this earth as the son of man, and you know this, the only thing the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them was to teach them how to pray. But prayer is so important to Jesus, that's what he's doing in heaven tonight. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been praying. Not just three and a half years as he taught his disciples and ministered three and a half years as he walked on this earth, there in Israel, he came to the end of his ministry and asked the disciples, what do you want? What can I do? What do you? And the only thing they wanted Jesus to teach them was how to pray. Because they saw the Son of Man get up every morning and spend time with his heavenly Father. You see, prayer was the lifeline Jesus had to his heavenly Father. And it's so important, prayer is so important that it's he ever live at the make of the intercession for us right now. For 2,000 years, he's been praying for us. Are you all out there? Prayer is important. Prayer is to our spirit life. What blood is to our physical life, without it, we're dead. There's 21 verses in Ephesians 6, 18, if you have a King James. If you have a new King James, there's 24 if you have another translation, does anybody else have another translation? Besides King? Okay, what do you have? Okay, how many words are in that? Ephesians 6, 18, how many words are in the ESV translation? 24. Okay, you got 24 in the ESV. You got 24 in the New King James Version. And you got 21 in the King James. So I don't care whether it's 24, 28, 27, 22, or 21. This one verse gives us seven principles on the power 
of a prayer warrior's prayer. You see, that whole armor of God is about spiritual warfare. We are in a war. We are in a spiritual warfare. And the battle is not simply won by putting on those six pieces of armor. The battle is won in prayer. Because once Paul gives us all the armor, then he says, it's time to go to war. Get on your knees. For he says, praying always. Because that's where the battles won or lost, on our knees. But in these 21 verses, we're going to see tonight seven powerful principles on a prayer warrior's prayer. I hope it'll change your life as it's changing mine. And I've done prayer seminars all over the country, all over the world, literally. I've never preached this message before till tonight. I want you to notice seven things. Number one, if you're taking notes in verse 18, notice first of all the, the persistence, the persistence of the warrior's prayer. The persistence of the warrior's prayer. And I want us to look at verse 18 and notice in your outline the word all, A-L-L, -L, occurs four times. Can I have a grunt out there, please? Can you write and say amen? Notice the persistence of the warrior's prayer. And for some reason, everything in the Bible is there for a purpose. Say amen to that. But in this one little short verse, why is the word all used four times? It's talking about the persistence of prayer. I want you to underscore it. Let's, let's read that verse again and underscore the word all. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching terror into with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Notice what Jesus said in your outline in Luke 18, 1. And he spake a parable unto the disciples of this sin that men ought sometimes, what does it say, folks? Always to pray and not to faint. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Now it says praying always. Look up here, guys. That doesn't mean we walk around muttering some mantra like we're some sort of zombie. Are you out there, please? Mumbling to ourselves like we're an idiot. That's not what it means about praying always. If you look at your outline, praying always refers to we must live in the spirit of prayer. We must be constantly in contact with our Father. Praying always. Never know when you're going to need a prayer. Praying in the elevator. Praying in the office. Praying in your car. Praying. I, I don't go any restaurant without praying for every person in there. Not by name, but I'm praying, Heavenly Father, I stand in the gap spirits of every lost man and woman in this restaurant. I don't care what restaurant I go to. I was at La Madeline's this morning as I go every morning. And I'm standing in the gap spiritually for every man, woman in that place. And I'm not praying this out loud like I'm an idiot. But you guys, we need to live in a spirit of prayer. It's not running around saying some sort of mantra and rubbing some beads and acting like zombies. But praying always speaks of, of our persistence in prayer. Look at your outline. Remember this about prayer. It's always too soon to quit. Remember this about prayer. It's always too soon to quit. There's the persistence of a prayer warrior. Satan will try to discourage you and I. Oh, I prayed for that person long enough. I prayed for this matter long enough. The answer's not coming. So we just stop and guess what? God was about to answer that prayer we got to pray with persistence. Look at your outline. Mentions a man by the name of George Mueller, one of the greatest prayer warriors of all time, who had five orphanages in Bristol, England. He never asked a person for one dime, not for one penny. George Mueller prayed about everything. And he just, he just took that request to his heavenly father, and for 40 years, God answered every prayer of those orphans because the Bible says God has a special connection with orphans. 
And he relied on prayer for all those years. But when you study his life and when God began to move in my life years ago after E.M. Bounds, I began to read some of the great prayer warriors like George Mueller. And he had a brother that was lost. And George Mueller prayed 40 years for his lost brother. And his brother did not get saved to the day of George Mueller's funeral. <laughs> he prayed 40 years. He never saw that prayer on earth answered. But it didn't stop him from praying. He could say, well, you know, I prayed for my brother. He's lost. He's a hard case. He's, 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 you know, he's, he's crossed the deadline. You keep praying anyway. George Mueller prayed 40 years for his brother. There's the persistence of prayer. Fill in the blanks, please. God will at the right time, God will at the right time and at the right place and for the right reasons will answer our prayers. You better remember that, guys. It's not your time, my place, or for my reason. God will at the right time, at the right place, and for the right reason will answer our prayers. Now, sometimes that may be no. Did you know that's the way, one of the ways God answers prayers? Aren't you glad he said no to some of your prayers? Some of you be married to the wrong person, or maybe you were married to the wrong person. Guys, God, that's no is one of the ways God answers our prayers. But he's made a promise in the greatest prayer promise in all the Bible. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show ye great mighty things thou knowest not. God has made a promise he'll answer every prayer you and I pray. But we gotta be persistent in, and at the right time, at the right place, and for the right reasons, God's gonna answer that prayer. But we've got to remain persistent. Praying always, that's the first principle of a prayer warrior. Number two, notice the possibilities of prayer. The possibilities of the warrior's prayer. In verse 18, he says, praying always with all prayer. With all prayer. Fill in the blanks. What do you mean all prayer? That means all prayer means praying on all occasions and in all places. There's not a time that we should not think prayer, we cannot pray a prayer. Same into that. And all occasions, breakfast, lunch, dinner, when you're going out, praying for a friend, on all occasions, not just on Sunday morning, on all occasions. My wife would tell you that Christian Hannah came on visit, and we're praying about something with them right now. They came and shared it with me and Kathy at lunch today, and it's 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 a blessing to our hearts to see what they're praying and asking us to pray with them about. But uh, you know, we just we we pray at all occasions. We don't have to be at the church house to pray. I asked Brett what to go, what time are you leaving? Because at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to pray and pray for Brett and Deanna. I'm up at 5, like many of you. It's not a big deal. I'm up at 5 anyway. I'm going to pray them as they move out and drive to Missouri. I will pray for them at 5 o'clock. That's all occasions, all places. I prayed for some of you when you went to surgery. I prayed for you. All occasions, all places. Praying always. With all prayers. Now look, look at your outline. All things should be covered by prayer. Nothing too little for us to pray about. Nothing too big for us to pray about. Have you ever thought about this? People say, well, I don't want, that's just a little thing. Did you know everything's little in God's eyes? Well, boy, this is a big one. Boy, this is a big prayer. I, bet, I, I, I guarantee you, listen. God, they're all little in God's eyes. He's the God of this universe. I'm not going to bother him with this little prayer. They're all little, guys, when it compared to our God. Are you out there, please? He wants to hear all of our prayers, regardless if they're little, small, or whatever you think, you and I think. They're all important to our Heavenly Father. All prayer, all things should be covered by prayer. I want to share this with you. I mentioned the other day that in teaching our children and grandchildren to pray, 
we need to teach them three kinds of prayers. And when you look at these three kinds, you'll see it in a few moments. This is all kinds of prayers. Literally, when you're teaching your children and grandchildren to pray, you're teaching them all kinds of prayers. Look at your outline. We teach them the please prayers. Love to hear children pray. Please be with me tomorrow. Please, can I have ice cream after dinner? There are all kinds of please prayers that our children pray. Say amen to that. They may not be important to you and I, but they're important to them. Please, don't let mama whip me. I told you Leighton played that two weeks ago. He's at our house because she's the, she's the disciplinarian in the family and she carries that spoon around. And Leighton must have done something because at the prayer deal, he said, please don't let mama whip me today. <laughs> I said, my God, Fee. You, but anyway, he said, please don't let mama whip me. There's please prayers. Teach them to pray please prayers. Number two, we need to teach our children to pray thank you prayers. Boy, we need to give thanks about everything. They need to learn young to say thank yous. They need to learn at an early age how to say thank you. They're never too young not to learn how to say thank you. There's please prayers. There's thank you prayers. And number three, there's sorry prayers. Sorry for pulling my sister's hair. Sorry for doing something wrong. Sorry prayers. Now, if you look at your outline, those three prayers is what all prayer is about. There's prayers of petition. That's please prayers. There's prayers of petition. That's please prayers. You see, as grown-ups, we're going to say, well, there's petition prayers, thank you prayers, there's, then there's confession prayers. Kids don't understand those big old words, but they understand please and thank you and sorry. And the please prayers are just prayers of petition. The prayers of thanksgiving is just thank you prayers. Then sorry prayers are simply the prayers of confession. Confessing I did something wrong and asking Jesus to forgive us. That's very simple. But we need to teach our children and grandchildren, teach them young to pray. Say amen to that. Some of us, it took some of us a long time to begin to learn the principles of prayer. And uh, we need to teach anything to our children today in this world which we're living in is the power of prayer. Praying always with all prayer. Notice number three, the petition of the warrior's prayer. The petition of the warrior's prayer, praying always with all prayer. Then verse 18 says, and supplication. Supplication simply means, say it out loud. Supplication means to ask. James 4, 7 says, we have not because we ask not. How many knows? Fell in the blank. How many knows this? Prayer works when we ask. That's simple, but prayer works when we ask. <laughs> if you don't ask, we have not because we ask not. Jesus said, well, that great prayer principle in Matthew 7, he said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. That's supplication. And he that seeketh findeth and he to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. That's the petition of prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Ask. Notice number four. The fourth principle of a prayer warrior's prayer is the power of the prayer warrior's prayer. The power. Because he says in verse 18, underscore in the spirit. Praying always with all things and supplication in the spirit. The power, look up here church, the power that drives our prayers is the spirit. He's the, he's the power behind our, our prayer life. In Romans 8, Paul said we have two helpers and I need all the help I can get in prayers. I, I, you know, I've been praying for a while, but I, I still don't know how to pray. I'm still learning how to pray. But I'm grateful. Paul said in Romans 8, 
we have two helpers to help us in our prayer life. Fill them in. Fill in the blanks. We, one who lives in heaven, our Savior. Because he ever lived with me. He's, he's praying for us right now. The disciples said, Jesus teaches how to pray. We got someone in heaven who helps us with our prayer life because he's praying for us right now. We have, Paul said in Romans 8, we have one who lives in heaven who's our Savior. Then we have one who lives in our heart. That's the Holy Spirit. And isn't it interesting that the Holy Trinity is involved in every prayer you and I pray if it's prayed in the right spirit. The Holy Spirit, a threefold cord is not easy to broke. Look at your outline. The Holy Spirit is involved when we pray. We pray to our Father through the Spirit in Jesus' name. Fill in the blanks. The Holy Spirit in us. Jesus interceding. And our Heavenly Father on His throne. So we have the Holy Trinity involved in our prayer life. Well, that's great comfort to me. You know, I have help in my prayer life. If those disciples needed help to learn how to pray, how much more do you and I need to learn how to pray? They walked with Jesus for three and a half years and heard all the prayers he ever prayed. They saw it for themselves. We read about it, but they were actually there. They heard, they heard the prayers that Jesus prayed that's not in the Word of God. There's just a number of prayers that the Holy Spirit records for us to hear when Jesus prays. But Jesus prayed more than the few times that his prayer life's mentioned in the Gospels. And just think, those men were there when Jesus was praying. And even though they heard him pray for three and a half years, the only thing they asked Jesus to teach them, Lord, teach us how to pray. Notice number five. Notice the perception, the perception of the warrior's prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there into perception, watching there into you know what mean watch means means to be alert, to be awake, to be watching. I shared with you the other night introducing this message. Three times, only three times in the New Testament, the Bible says, "Watch and pray." Look up here. Only three times, watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray. And every one of the those times that the Bible mentions it, it deals with our our threefold enemies. The world, our flesh, and the devil. That blesses me to know that the only three times watch and pray is used in the scriptures helps us to understand that, that we have help when we watch and pray over our three main enemies. The world, our flesh, and the devil. Look at number one. Mark chapter 13, the first time we are told to watch and pray, we'll win over the world. We'll win over this world. You and I can't win over this world without prayer. This old worldly system in which we live in that hates God, hates Christ, hates the Bible. Jesus said, take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. The second time we were told to watch and pray, we went over our flesh. And this same verse is used twice. It's the same, Mark tells it one way, Matthew tells it the other, but it's the same verse. Matthew 26, 41, Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray, we'll win over the world. Watch and pray, you'll win over your flesh. And number three, in Ephesians 8, 8 Ephesians 6, 18, the third time we're told to watch and pray, we'll win over the devil. I told you, Ephesians 6 says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, power of his might. Because we have a battle with the devil. Put on the whole armor of God that you may withstand the wiles of the devil. And how do we defeat him? By watching and praying. So there, look up here, church. How do we win over our three greatest enemies? Over the world, our flesh, and the devil is prayer. It's prayer. 
Look up here. Before Jesus drew the sword in Matthew 4, when Satan tempted him, Jesus had been praying for 40 days. You see, he was watching and praying. And when the devil came, he was ready. He prayed 40 days. He was praying and fasting 40 days. The perception of the prayer warrior. Watch and pray. Number six, notice the perseverance of the warrior's prayer. In fact, verse 18 mentions the word perseverance. Did you see that? That's one of the principles of a prayer warrior. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Watching there in two with all perseverance. To pray effectively, church, we've got to persevere. That New Testament church, the Bible says they were unlearned and ignorant men. None of them have been to seminary. None of them have been to a Bible college. They were unlearned, ignorant men, just old fishermen, just old common folks. But they had learned where the power was and they turned the world upside down. And one of the things that that New Testament church learned was they persevered in prayer. For notice in Acts 1, notice what it says about that New Testament church that turned the world upside down. It says, these all continued. That's perseverance. Church, we've got to continue on in prayer. These all continued with one accord in prayer. Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then the apostles said this in Acts 6.4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Do you notice prayer comes before ministry? Prayer comes, worship comes before work. They said, we're going to pray before we go teach a Sunday school class. We're going to go pray before we preach a sermon. We're going to continue to give ourselves to prayer. Sometimes we spend more time preparing that Sunday school lesson than we do spending time with Jesus in prayer. They said, we're going to continually, we're going to, we, we, we'll con- give ourselves continually in prayer. They persevere. We must pray even when we don't feel like praying. There's been times in my life I didn't feel like praying, and so did you. You're not as spiritual as you think you are. Sometimes I don't feel like praying, but you know what I do? I pray. You pray when you feel like it, and you pray when you don't, because that's what the Bible tells us to do. We're going to pray on. We're going to soldier on. We're not a bunch of wimps. We're warriors. We're going to soldier on. Those times we don't feel like praying, we're going to soldier on. Well, notice number seven. The purpose of the warrior's prayer. 21 words. Pray without ceasing, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Watching there in two with all perseverance and look at it and supplication for what? I'm asking y'all what it is. What? Say it out loud. The purpose of a warrior's prayer is to pray for others. In Job 42, The Bible says that God restored Job's losses. Remember, he lost everything. But in Job 42, the Bible says Job restored, God restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. When he started praying for others, God blessed him. We cannot get out of this I, me, and mine, and and that's nothing wrong with that because Jesus taught us in the model prayer, give us this day our daily bread. But you know what? The highest kind of prayer in the Bible, fill in the blanks. The highest kind of prayer in the Bible is not petition, 
not, not thanksgiving, not confession, the highest kind of prayer is interceding. Interceding prayer. Intercession prayer. That means praying for others. And what is Jesus doing right now in Hebrews 7.25? He's praying for others. The reason, church, we end all of our services praying for one another because that's what prayer, that's what warriors are supposed to do. We're not going nowhere, guys. You get, I don't know where you're getting ready to go, but this is just the introduction. The reason we end all of our services, whether it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, the reason we end all of our services with prayer, because that's what prayer, prayer warriors do. They pray. For others. Amen. Satan doesn't fear. He doesn't fear our preaching. In fact, he likes a lot of our preaching, especially these liberals. It's taking fire out of hell and the inspiration out of the Bible. And all he loves liberal preaching, tickling people's ears. Satan doesn't fear our preaching. He doesn't fear our worship and praise. He doesn't fear our Sunday school classes. He doesn't fear our new buildings. But he's scared to death of the weakest saint on their knees. Make war on the floor. Because that's where the battles won or lost. One of the things that we've tried to do through the years, and I haven't done this before here, is a prayer ministry for all of our services. We want God to move in our worship services. We want him to move in our Sunday school classes. We want him to move in our Mother's Day out. We want him to move in our, the ministries that God has given us here at Cornerstone whether it's here or Tuesday night, your Bible study, or wherever we may be. I'm going to ask some men to help us pass these out. If you get some men to do this right quick, guys, do it quickly. We don't got all night. Please please hand some. Get them to start passing them out, guys. Here, hand, let's go, Butch. You're slowing us down. Come on, let's go. Butch is not running for politician, just running for sheriff back there. Just pass the thing out. Thank you, thank you. Does does everybody have one? No, we got up here, guys. Butch, you walk. I'm sorry, girls. Anybody else, guys? Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spake the word of God with boldness. Ephesians 6.18, we just went over that. These are great scriptures to claim. But we need to pray for these following people. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, we need to pray for our singers. The soloist, our song leader, our worship and praise. We need to pray for these men and women who are up here leading us in worship and praise. That God will fill them with the Holy Spirit. When they sing, they're singing with anointing. We're not here to hear their lovely voices. We're here to them to lift up Jesus, and they do. But you need to pray for these people. And they have names, by the way. See, God answers specific prayers. I pray for every one of these people in my prayer time on Sunday mornings by name. If you don't know them, they're here tonight. We need to pray for our speaker, whoever that is. Your Sunday school teacher. Before you ever get here, you need to pray for that Sunday school teacher, whatever her name is or whatever. His, you need to pray for them. The speaker, I'm not always preaching here, but 
whether it's Brother Michael or Brother Robert, whoever's here, we need to pray for the speaker, the one who's preaching and teaching God's Word. We need to pray for the sermon or Sunday school lesson that it will be Christ-centered and spirit-strong. We need to pray for sinners. We need to pray for lost people, guys. On Sunday mornings, we get here early. I was here this morning at 1.30 in the morning. I get here early on Sunday morning. 1.30 to 2 every Sunday. We have men that get here around 6. Rob's always here at 6. But I usually get here at least before 2 o'clock. And I've done that since Robin Wood days, sexy days, and here. Because let me tell you, it's not about me. I want the Spirit of God in this place. I'm not doing this for you or me. I'm doing it for Him because I'm concerned about people in this service. Number one, starting with me. And I will not share with you when I get in here that time to pray over this service and pray over those chairs you're sitting in, praying over those singers. Those who play the instruments by name, praying for the sound, people working the sound. I pray for Howard Parr every time because he's part of our online ministry. I pray for Rick Dinker. I pray for Nathaniel who's here on Sunday morning, whoever else may be. But I pray for those men specifically. Guys, you know, it's more than just showing up here and hearing a message or hearing a song. It's, It's... We gotta pray. I pray every day on Sunday morning, for, starting with Diane, our nursery workers, going to Cindy Harris and Deborah Zoutman, the preschool, going to our children with Randy and Sandy Fletcher now, going to our youth with Cameron when he's here, and Greg and Leanne and Stacy. Then we go to our adults, and I pray for Michael. I pray for Debbie. I pray for Sherry. I pray for Mike. Those who are teaching Sunday school. I pray for those four men that are always here at 7 o'clock on Sunday. I pray for them by name before they ever get here. Pray for our greeters out there. My God, they need it. No, we've got to pray for these guys. they got a ministry. I pray for Carl and George and Jan. I pray for Butch, that he wouldn't stop aggravating everybody that comes up. I pray for Bob Vandergriff. He's always out there. He's not here. But I pray for him. Those are people that are out there every Sunday. Welcome people. Hey, glad to have you. That means something to people, okay? Do you understand that? That's a tremendous ministry. Praying for our staff, our office manager. You know, whatever. Pray for Leela and all of our workers with our Mother's Day out. Praying for our elders and our deacons, Rob and Brett. We got to pray for people by name. Pray, Heavenly Father, if there's anybody online this morning or tonight that's never been saved, please, Holy Spirit, reach those lost people and unsaved church members online. I pray for them in the morning. I pray for every lost person to be here today. I don't know who they are, but Jesus does. I didn't know those three ladies that got saved this morning, but the Holy Spirit did, but somebody prayed for them, even though I didn't know their names. We've got to pray for lost people. This building is not here for you and I. We can never lose the passion for lost people. Pray for sinners. Pray for the saints. Pray for those that we know that would love to be here that can't. And we, we pray for all of them in all of our services. Pray for Miss Patty this morning. She's really been struggling with her COPD. And Danny, pray for these precious people. We don't just, we've got to pray for them. They all got names. Servants, the counselors, and ushers. Notice Satan. I don't pray for the heathen. Are you out there, please? But there's three things we pray in the name of Jesus. We can bind Satan, the Bible says. We can bind Satan and his demons from your Sunday school class, from this worship center, 
We, can, we have in the power in the name of Jesus. We have authority over the enemy. And in Jesus' name, we can bind the three main demons that come to every worship service of a soul-winning New Testament Christ-exalting church. Now, Satan feels right at home in a lot of our lukewarm churches. Sometimes he's in the pulpit. But let me tell you, he don't like churches concerned about souls and concerned about lifting up the name of Jesus. We have authority over him, and we need to bind him in every service. Write it down. In the name of Jesus, we need to bind Satan in the spirits, number one, of pride. You know what? Pride's kept many a man and woman from coming to Jesus. People need to come to, you know what keeps them from walking this aisle and, or raising their hand or praying their prayer? Pride. It's the greatest sin God hates. It's the first sin ever committed. Pride's what made Lucifer the devil, the sin of pride. The seven sins that are listed in Proverbs 6, these six sins God hates, yea, seven are abominable. The first sin mentioned in God's hate list is pride. Pride keeps a lot of people from making decisions for Jesus. Number two, we need to bind the spirit of procrastination. That's what got old Felix. We preached about him this morning. He said to Paul, come back at a more convenient season. How many people are in our service and how many watch on, online they said, well, not today. Um, not, not today. Uh, may, maybe some other time. That's a spirit, friends. Of putting off to tomorrow what we know God's Holy Spirit wants us to do today. That's why the Bible says over and over in the New Testament, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. That is a spirit. It's a spirit of procrastination. Telling people come to service well, I'll, maybe I'll do it next week. That's a lie from hell because we don't have assurance of next week. We bind the spirit, number one, of pride, procrastination, and number three, of presumption. And let me tell you what that is. That's happened to a lot of us in this service. Happened a lot on the line. You know what that is? We presume that we're a Christian and we're not really a Christian. Some of you, just like me, presumed for years I was a Christian because I was baptized when I was eight because I believed in Jesus like a lot of people in this church, like Brett and Deanna, both presumed for years that they were saved, but they were lost. That's a spirit of presumption, just like perhaps some here tonight, some online. You presume you're a Christian because you, you believe in Jesus and you come to church and you read your Bible. Those people did too. So did my daddy when he was 85, 78 years old when he got saved. So did Kathy's dad who was in his 70s when he got saved at First Baptist Church, Saxe. A lot of people presume that they're saved when they've never been saved. That is a spirit. Are you all out there, please? I take authority over those three every morning in this, before you ever get up because they'll show up. They're going to be here even when you and I are not. We need to pray and bind Satan. Number, the next one, the Spirit of God, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit has freedom to move in all of our services. For the Bible says, it's not without, it's not might nor power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We welcome the Holy Spirit here. We welcome the Holy Spirit here. We welcome you. I don't want to be here if he's not going to be here. Because if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, it don't matter what kind of sermon you preach, what song, without the Spirit ain't nothing going to happen. We're totally dependent upon the Spirit of God to move and work, to stir hearts and change lives. That's not, my, that's not up to me. I can't do that. That's the Spirit's ministry. And we welcome Him to do it every service, starting with me. Pray specifically for people you know in the service. People are hurting. You Sunday school teachers, you ought to be on the front line with this. You know in your class people are hurting. 
pray for them for you ever get here. We pray for them in our Sunday school class, but we need to pray for them for ever get here. You know the needs of people in this church. Pray specifically for them. Miss Jan Bottoford would love to be at church. And we welcome her here. We pray for her because she's, even though she, but she's here, we love her. Alfred, and Pat, all those people, I guarantee you, Billy Mack Thomason, he drove all the way from Farmersville when he didn't feel like it. And by the way, I, talk, I call him every day. I called Trent this afternoon. Check on mom and dad. Told him I'd be there Tuesday because that's the day they get Whataburger biscuits and gravy. So I checked, how are they doing? I want to give a report tonight to Rent. He said, boy, mom and dad had a great day. He said, thank you. Thank the people who sent them prayer grams. Some of you have been in the upper room and you sent them prayer grams. Some of you have clueless about what that is. But you know what we need to do? We need some help, church. We need to move some of those prayer grams back into the auditorium. And we need to get them, Brian. We need to get some in our, here in our seats. We need to start doing that. We got prayer grams, guys. That we need to pick up a prayer gram and send it to some of these people. We, they know we're praying, but you know what it means to Billy Mack and Chloe this week? They got two prayer grams from the church. I said, man, I didn't even know this lady that prayed for me. <laughs> That's a blessing. Guys, we can minister in ways that we just sat here. We need to get those prayer grams in this auditorium. Maybe you want to send somebody. We need to send one to Lisa Payne. God, let her know that we're all praying for her. But you know what? She gets that letter. That even means that much more to her. Those prayer grounds, pray specifically. Then finally and most importantly, most importantly of all this, is pray that our Savior will be lifted up. Would you put John 12 at the bottom of your outline? I shared that scripture with you this morning where Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And we want to make sure that every time we meet here at church, whether it's Sunday school or worship, that we always lift up Jesus. It's all about him. It's not about us. It's all about him. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw people to me. And there's a lot of people in Collin County and around this area that we want to be drawn here. You know how this works? We had a couple join a couple weeks ago. They got up to go to their church that they were members of in Plano. And they got up to go to church. And they said, you know what? The Holy Spirit just told me I'm not, don't go there. He said, what? He said, you go to Cornerstone. Because there's someone in this church that had been talking to them about their church home. Just invited them. We weren't proselyting. I will in a heartbeat. But just sharing about, hey, we'd love to have you at Cornerstone. And one morning this couple got up to go to church. And the Holy Spirit said, no, no. We want you to, I want you to go to Cornerstone. They came for the very first time in their 20-year-old son got saved. Amen. What if they had been disobedient? <laughs> Their boy got saved. And I'm talking about Nathaniel. I love Nathaniel. Because <laughs> his daddy would listen to the Spirit of God. They were drawn here, and their boy got saved. And then a couple of weeks later, Richard and Wanda, his wife, they joined. Amen. They were here this morning. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And as long as we keep lifting up Jesus, God's going to keep bringing people to us. Prayer warrior's prayer, praying always with all prayers and supplication in the Spirit, watching there into all things.
and supplication for all people. I'm going to ask every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here tonight at your home watching this service, God's Holy Spirit's been speaking to your heart. Not sure you're saved. You're almost persuaded. Just like old Agrippa. Almost there. But you're not there yet. And God in His mercy has given you another opportunity. Tonight. If you're not sure you made that commitment to Jesus in your heart, then we pray tonight you'll do that. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. And if you'd like to make that commitment to Him tonight at home or here at Cornerstone and God's Holy Spirit has knocked at your heart's door, would you pray this prayer in your heart as I pray it out loud right now? Would you pray, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Without you, I know I'm lost. But tonight, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're at home tonight, you prayed that prayer, you tell someone. That's one of the ways you know that prayer was real. If you're here at Cornerstone, you've been struggling with this for a while, but tonight you let go and let Jesus have his will in your life. You made that commitment to him. You're fully persuaded now. You're not an almost Christian. If you prayed that prayer tonight, you're here. Would you raise your hand? God bless you, Jeff. Anybody else? This young man's been struggling with this decision. He texted me this afternoon when he got home. Said I hadn't been able to sleep for weeks and now I know why after this morning's message. And he's here tonight and he prayed the sinner's prayer. Come on, Jeff. God bless you. You see, God's word ain't gonna return into him, boy. Say amen to that. And tonight, look up here. Jeff prayed that prayer. He joined this church. But he comes tonight joining Jesus. Love you, my brother. Be seated. Isn't that great? Man, prayer works. <laughs> well, guys, let's do what prayer warriors do. Let's pray for one another. Get in your groups. People got prayer requests. You know who some of them are. Remember Judy back there has got breast cancer. Let's remember one another. Let's get together and pray, guys. Jesus, like the fragrance after the